Hello everybody, today we're looking at The Breaks of the Game by David Halberstam. This episode is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. With over 200 billion players worldwide, I'm just kidding, I'm not actually sponsored by Raids, Raid, Shadow, Shadows, but you know, Raid, if you're listening, send me a DM. Okay, anyway, yeah, The Breaks of the Game is ostensibly a book about basketball. In particular, the 1979-1980 season of the Portland Trailblazers. But saying this is a book about basketball is like saying The Lord of the Rings is a book about a ring. It's selling it woefully short. To understand why, it helps to take a quick look at the author. David Halberstam was an American writer, journalist, and historian known for his work on the Vietnam War, politics, history, the civil rights movement, business, media, American culture, and later, sports journalism. He won a Pulitzer Prize for international reporting in 1964. That's directly from his Wikipedia, and I think it helps frame the fact that the breaks of the game is about so much more than basketball, and written by a guy that's qualified to write about so much more than basketball. This book contains no less than the observation and retelling of the Blazers' 79-80 season, a difficult season post-championship featuring a team struggling to find its identity and laden with individual players dealing with their own personal situations. An in-depth look at Jack Ramsey and other coaches in the NBA, their stylistic differences, their motivations, the nuances of how they dealt with their players and the evolving league around them, and the toll that coaching at the highest level took on them psychologically. Dozens of vignettes on NBA players that not only delves into their basketball lives, but deep dives into their physical profile, their injury history, how their injuries affected their career and mental health and earning ability, money and contractual disputes, negotiations and embitterment, trade rumors and the hassle of having to relocate your family and start over, race and its pervasive effect on roster management, contracts, treatment from peers, coaches, press, and fans. The financial aspects of running a basketball team as a business and the type of relationships that were created with other professionals in the field, including coaches, players, other owners, the press, and agents. Also the difference between the OG owners and the new owners, who are more attracted to the NBA as a business opportunity and less as stewards or fans of the game. The undercooked evolution of the sport due to the rapid influx of network television money what the league looked like before and after money changed the landscape, and how it formed the underpinnings of what the league currently looks like today. On page 14, Halberstam describes it succinctly. All this took place in less than a decade. Sudden growth, the shift of values from those of pure sports to entertainment and advertising. What had happened to basketball was typical of altogether too much happening in the new American scheme of things. There was more, but it was less. Mm, well said, well said. I'm sure I'm missing many facets of what is in this book, but as you can see from the list above, this book is an exhaustive look at American culture and business and economics through the lens of sports journalism. His writing is direct and impeccable, as you would expect from a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and his depictions on race in particular feels as relevant as ever given the climate of what's currently happening in the United States. As a lifelong basketball fan, I can't say that I learned that much about the sport in particular, but I learned so much about the tertiary parts of the league, and what resonated with me more than anything was the depth of reporting done on individual players, particularly the cases that highlighted the racist machinations of the time. So often as a sports fan, I'm guilty of looking at a player and summing them up in a snapshot. Ron Artest is the guy that went after the fans in the stands. Kwame Brown is the scrub that Jordan drafted who couldn't play basketball. Jason Tatum is my only hope for a bright future, etc. But Halberstam doesn't allow you to look and think of players that way. His in-depth reporting that features a dozen or so players fully fleshes them out as human beings with complex motivations, desires, and flaws, just like the rest of us. It discusses their upbringing where and if they attended university, influential figures in their lives, their personality and characteristics, detailed breakdowns of their injuries and the treatments and recovery processes, the relationships they build or destroy during their careers, and most impactfully, the nuances of the racial divide. 
The player portraits are filled in gradually as the book progresses, and I really think they're the highlight of this book. Bill Walton, while not an entirely sympathetic figure in this book, suffers so many physical setbacks that you can't help but to feel for him. Halberstam goes into great detail about Walton's feet and the pain that it caused him, not just physically, but mentally, and hell, for Walton, even spiritually. Maurice Lucas, the perfect foil to Walton, spends the majority of the book disgruntled because of contract disputes. He rightly feels that he's being underpaid and treated differently than Walton, despite being arguably just as valuable to the team's success. Is it because he's black? Quite possibly. As I said, there are dozens of player portraits seasoning this book like sprinkles of salt, and they are almost unanimously fascinating. My two personal favorites are Kermit Washington and Billy Ray Bates. Kermit Washington is another player that was and possibly still is guilty of the snapshot assessment from fans. He's the black one-punch man, famous for shattering Rudy Tom Jonovitz's face like a delicate vase with one punch that nearly killed him. But actually, Kermit wasn't at all what you'd expect, according to Halberstam. He grew up painfully shy. In fact, he hardly talked. He had no sense of his own worth at all, which mainly came from growing up in the wrong world, the black world. On page 202, Halberstam states, There were two worlds out there, one that successful people came from and one that black people came from. Kermit was so desperate for affirmation that a handful of people could be credited with changing his life's trajectory. From the high school teacher who left Kermit stunned simply by telling him that he could get good marks if he wanted to, to his wife, who met him as a college freshman and bowled her way into his life, deciding that Kermit could be and would be something, whether he believed it or not, to the coach who gave him a chance, the only chance he needed to prove himself and eventually graduate as a scholastic All-American and a top-five draft pick, to Pete Newell, a coach that took an interest in Kermit early in his NBA career and gave him the confidence to play his position and play it well. Then, of course, all this success was temporarily derailed by the Tom Janovich incident. Afterwards, Washington had to build himself up all over again. Halberstam writes all of this in a svelte and detached prose. He's just reporting the facts, and yet this part of the book hit me hard emotionally. It's a powerful piece of what it meant to persevere as a black athlete in the 70s and 80s. Then there's Billy Ray Bates. Billy Ray Bates grew up on a farm picking cotton for his boss. He didn't know how to read. He was never taught. This was normal. Let that sink in. This was in the 1970s. His upbringing really shocked me, to be honest. It sounds so much like slavery and I couldn't believe that this kind of shit was still happening in the 1970s and 80s. And it really helps to illuminate how even today in 2020, there's a massive racial divide in the United States. Despite his upbringing being bereft of naturally occurring opportunities, Billy Ray wasn't the timid youth that Kermit Washington was. In fact, he was brash and supremely confident in his abilities. He played a flashy style that many blacks at the time played, and that was still looked at with suspicion and condescension by the white-run NBA. Nevertheless, Billy Ray Bates eventually got his chance on the injury-addled and struggling Portland Trailblazers and almost single-handedly breathed life back into a deflated team. Unfortunately, Billy Ray's story doesn't have a happy ending, but he did blaze his trail and have his moment in the sun. Halberstam has written an insightful and substantial work here under the guise of a sports book. I would highly recommend anyone to read it, even if you're not a sports fan. It's that good. I'll finish this review with another quote from the book. It's from the perspective of a scout on page 308, musing about his career. And as a teacher who was also passionate about my work, it really resonated with me. Sometimes he wondered why he put so much time and energy into what was only a sport, boys jumping up and down. Wasn't there, he occasionally wondered, something more important he should be doing? Then he would pick up on a talented young kid, and he would understand why he did what he did. It was because he loved it. As I find the five-star system a bit limiting, I like to use my subjective rating system, Slick, 
which stands for Story, Language, Ideas, and Characters on a 10-point scale. Here's how I rated the breaks of the game. For Story, I gave it a 9. It's not the story of the Trailblazers' season that's riveting, it's everything that orbits it. For Language, I gave it a 10. I couldn't find a single flaw with the writing. It's impeccable, and it stands the test of time. For Ideas, I gave it an 8. There's nothing original or revolutionary here, but it's certainly illuminating, particularly in the way it sheds light on how common racism was just a few short decades ago. For Characters, I gave it a 9. Professional athletes don't usually elicit sympathy, but Halberstam is tremendous with the way he humanizes them. I also strive for a contrived comparison with every book, but this time I failed. I've got nothing. No jokes, nothing funny to say about this book. I suck. Oh well, maybe next week. To my two and a half loyal listeners, I'm making up some I Listen to Ransom reviews before no one did t-shirts, so stay tuned to find out how to get your hands on one of these brilliant pieces of Americana. Other than that, see you next week on Ransom Reviews.